I'm Chris Sanchez and welcome to Sonoma Views, where we talk real estate, property management, and local restaurant reviews. In this video, I'm going to tell you about how to deal with a tenant who's disputing their security deposit refund after they moved out. Thank you very much for being here, so let's get started. All right, so I'm going to paint a scenario for you. At this point, which I'm talking about is when a tenant has given you the keys back to your rental property, they've moved away and you've gone through and assessed the damages, gone through the property, done the full move out inspection. You've checked for cleaning, possibly made repairs, got estimates for work that needs to be done, probably got work done already. And you took that security deposit and you mailed back the, the difference. You made char took charges away from their security deposit uh, for cleaning or repairs and you refunded their portion back to the tenant. Tenant receives it in the mail. They get it. They blow a gasket. They're not happy. They're pissed off. They want to. Um, they want to dispute the charges. They're not happy, and it could be for a number of reasons. So that's the situation we're in in this scenario. And I want to talk you through the the steps on how to how to handle it, and hopefully so you get a better outcome and hopefully stay out of court, save time and save money. So I really hope this information could be of uh, benefit and help to to you or somebody you know. Uh, number one, send the refund and closing statement within 21 days. I'm in Sonoma County, California, so we go based on California laws. And this is actually found under Civil Code 1950. And there are security deposit and procedures, which are part of California law. Okay, um, so you could definitely read into greater, greater detail on that. I'm giving you the summarized version. Send the refund, security deposit refund, their portion, and if you take any money from their refund for repairs or expenses or damages caused by the tenants, include an itemized closing statement that shows line by line where all that money went. Send it within 21 days from the day that you receive keys back to the property. Excuse me. And those are 21 calendar days, not business days. So if, you, if they give you the keys on April 1st, you should have that check in the mail. It should be by the 20th, if not sooner, the 21st is your deadline date. And that's the day that it should be postmarked. So don't wait the three weeks. If you don't have to, speed it up. Try to get it out within two weeks so you don't wor have to worry about that. If the refund does not go out within the 21 days, that tenant could turn around and sue you, not only for the amount that they're disputing, not only for the amount of their original security deposit, but two times double their security deposit. So if they had a $3,000 security deposit and you failed to mail it out in time, they could turn around and just sue you for that and it could cost you $6,000. So not only did you make, did they leave the property in bad condition, you had to do cleaning, you had to pay for repairs, you're out of pocket expenses. Now a judge says you have to pay them their full refund, $3,000, plus an extra $3,000 for damages. That's not smart. All right, so 21 days, burn that into your brain. Number two, include invoices. When you send out that closing statement, when you send out the refund check with the closing statement, also include copies of invoices, actual repairs that are done. If you hire Joe Handyman Service to do a certain job, include the invoice, include proof of payment. Prove to the tenant that you actually spent that money on those repairs to repair those damages that the tenant caused. Prove that you paid Molly Maid or Mary Maid's or Mary's Cleaning Service $400 for the deep cleaning because uh, the tenants left the property a mess and they didn't do cleaning. You wanna include those uh, copies of invoices because that's why you're keeping their money because you had to spend money to do things that they didn't do. And you're using their money to reimburse yourself for, the, um, for those expenses. Number three, keep copies of your mailing. So I recommend keep a copy of the check, the actual check, take a photocopy of it, or you could use a phone, take a photo of it and save that, that photo, email it to yourself so you have a record of it, but take a photo of the actual check, keep photocopies of the invoices and receipts, and I also take a photocopy of the actual uh, envelope that's you know shows my address and it shows the tenant's address and we use um, a postage meter, but you could put a stamp on there and that's your pr proof of mailing. You wanna prove that you sent it out within the 21 days, okay? You're gonna need that. Now, number four, we get to the 
dispute process, tenant receives the letter in the mail. It has their check, it has their closing statement, it even includes invoices, copies of the invoices. You even took it a step further, you even included photos of the damages to coincide with the invoices and receipts for the repairs. Here's that hole in the wall, here's that broken light fixture, um, here's that screen that was torn, okay? All those things. Maybe you, you, you did all that and the tenants receive it and the, they're still mad. They're disputing the charges. So that's where the point where, where we are, the dispute process. So what they need to do, maybe it's by phone or by text, you should say, listen, I hear you. Let's talk through it. You need to put that request in writing. Okay. So instead of just going back and forth with them, have the tenants give you a, an official, a formal letter. Dear landlord, I received this. I dispute the following charges for X, Y, Z reason and uh, what the request is. So maybe they're asking for a full refund or, you know, they're demanding refund my entire security deposit by such date because that's the process that the tenant has, has to go through before they take you to court. So they have to try to collect or try to settle it and give you the opportunity and give you the demand to respond. So have the tenant put it in writing. Next step is respond. Respond to their letter and try to do that sooner rather than later. Don't ignore it, don't sweep it under the rug because it's just gonna boil up and it'll get worse, trust me. Uh, I've been there, done that, I made some mistakes and I'm trying to help you avoid mistakes. I'm trying to save you time and try to save you money. So respond and that response could be, okay, let's work it out and just here's your money, go away, we're done, okay? That's one option. The other option is like, on the other hand, nope, firm, take it or leave it, I'm not paying you a penny more. That's a response, but just, I received your letter, thank you very much, nope, all of these charges, they're staying, I'm not releasing any more money, okay? We know where that's gonna lead, but that's a response. And then the middle of the ground response might be a settlement. Maybe you could, um, Either, ideally with, between two parties, but if you need to get a third party, you can get somebody in there to help mediate, but it's just try to try to settle. All right, it's $600 in dispute. How about we just split this? I, here's my expenses, 300 bucks. I'll give you 300 bucks back and we're done, okay? Or any variation there, but you could still influence that outcome and just maybe both parties are not 100% happy with the situation, but you're able to come to a resolution and keep it out of court. So try to mediate, respond if you can. If you cannot arrive at a settlement or a resolution between the parties, then just wait for it, start getting ready for court. It might take a while. I would say if, if, 10, if 10 angry tenants uh, have threatened for small claims court, maybe one or two will actually do it. Maybe one, maybe two will actually go through. But a lot of tenants always threaten. So what I say, because <laughs> because I just go through it all the time, it's like, great, who's your attorney? You know, they'll threaten with attorneys. And by the way, attorneys are not a, uh, allowed in small claims court. But tenants don't know that. They'll threaten, oh, we're going to get um, a legal representation. Okay, great. Uh, what's the name of your attorney? I would like to speak with him or her. Okay. And, um, well, we haven't uh, determined that yet. I've, I've heard all sorts of responses. And when you put them on the spot, well, great. Who's your attorney? I want to speak with them. Oh, yeah, guess what? If that attorney is representing that client, when they're spending time talking to me, they're racking up the bill for the tenant. Tenants don't want to pay legal fees yet. <laughs> they want their money. So um, it, it, it rarely happens. You know, it rarely happens where somebody actually has an attorney. And they might get uh, recommendations, they may be counseled, but when it comes to small claims, it's small claims are for small amounts, okay? Attorneys do not go and represent the, the tenants during that. So it still behooves both parties, it benefits both parties to try to settle it before it gets to that point. So just get prepared. If they wanna to go to small claims court, they'll do it. They have to put up money, they have to go file with the court, open up the lawsuit, they have to legally serve you, uh, legal service and then you'll have a scheduled court date so on that note pick your battles when you're looking at um, the previous uh, response in the settlement um, uh, settlement stage if you go to court it might cost you more money because a judge could rule in the favor of the tenant
and it could cost you more money. So if you were bickering over 300 bucks, you might be coming out with a $3,000 bill at the end. So there's always that possibility. You might be able to nip it in the bud by just agreeing to keep it out of court, okay? But if you don't, the tenants will go to the next step, go to small claims court, and then you have to show up. And when you get to small claims court, the judge doesn't even hear it. Before the judge even hears the story, they put you outside in the lobby area and you have to talk to a third party mediator first. And you're kind of back to square one, which is you just have a person in the middle of between you and the tenant trying to talk about the same things that you were talking about before. You could have just addressed it directly with the tenant, but now you have a third party who is advocating for both sides just trying to get a resolution. If you cannot resolve it, even at that stage, then you go back into the courtroom. Then the judge hears both stories based on evidence, proof, documentation. Whoever has the better file is going to win, usually. So... If the tenant has a really good file, even if you're right, the judge might say, you know what, I hear what you're saying, Mr. Landlord, but unfortunately you don't have the evidence to support that. This tenant does. I had one of those not too long ago, less than a year ago, not only cost me the refund plus $1,000. And it's just because I didn't have all the, the right documentation that I should have had. So lesson learned. Thank you very much for being here. I'm Chris Sanchez. This is Sonoma Views. I hope this information is valuable in one way or another. Please feel free to subscribe if you'd like to receive future videos. Cheers.